how far can you really take your story? Because you have infinite stories. I mean, we could talk for days about the stuff that didn't make into the documentary. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like a bowl of spaghetti. You know, you start out and you're like, oh, this looks so good. And the more you eat, it's like it's <laughs> never ending. It never ends. <laughs> you know, and, and I just wonder how you can kind of even put your life into a narrative with a duration attached to it. It's kind of a crazy experience. So, Amy Scott, I looked at several directors. First and foremost, Showtime and Scooter, my manager, came to me and said, want you to do a documentary? And I was like, absolutely not. Yeah, I'm so you. not into that idea. Yeah. And can I ask you just quickly why? Because multiple reasons roll around my head while well, why first I of all, I always just thought documentaries were something that were like kind of at the end of your career. And I still feel like I have like, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm not quite on the back nine yet. And, um, but the other thing is I'm really private and I just, I, don't, I didn't want it to feel like a, this is your life and look at all the awards and so once we sort of discussed how it should be and decided it should be the story of the person as opposed to the career, it made more sense to me. And I have to say, I love documentaries. I mean, the Nina Simone documentary, the Wings documentary. We, we watch documentaries on the road all the time. And even the Go-Go's. I mean, I watched that one recently. I was just like, holy shit. I that mean, was great. But, you know, it's like, I, I don't know. I just think... It's it's good, especially in the day and age where everything is so branded and we we sort of manipulate what we want people to know about us, um, which is, that's, I'm so, I'm too old for that. Like, I'm not born into the social media era. My kids are like, Mom, you know you were born in the 1780s. And I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah, so happy. Yeah, me too. And by the way, we've had to adapt to that experience. And yeah. so we're always going to be a little suspicious of it because yeah. we come from a place where we're able to control the boundaries between what you know and what you don't know. Yeah. And now your kids and to some degree our kids, they were born into it. I know. And that's another interesting thing. It's like, when do you let your kids watch a documentary? At what point do they realize that you actually were a fully formed person before they were born? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. But, um, and most human beings don't even have that option. We just get to tell the stories we want to tell. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's not enough ways, there's not enough stories for you to keep back from them for the documentary to be compelling. So it's got to be all out there. It is, and you know what? There, It's warts and all. And there's a whole, I mean, there's there are five other documentaries on the cutting room floor which eventually they'll know about all that stuff too. And it, it, some of the stuff has really hard stuff, you know. Um, my kids are going to grow up understanding what mental illness is. They're going to grow up understanding what it means to be a woman, not just in the 80s and 90s, but it's still going on. It is. And also they're growing up with an older mom and they're seeing, they're seeing, you know, when they watch the documentary, they'll see a young person who was at the top of their game and they're living with the person now who's still doing it, but it's not the same, you know. What is the game and where is the top are the questions that you got to ask yourself all the time. And if you can answer them honestly without comparing apples and oranges, yeah. there's always a new top and a new game. Yeah. That's what I well, think. Well, I love, I love this part of my life so much. I wouldn't change one single thing about it. And there's something really liberating about, I mean, I hate to even say it. I say there's something liberating about not being relevant. I am relevant, but there, <laughs> don't shake your head at me. I just mean, it's, I'm not so going to ever write. Right now, ever say that about what you don't ever know. Well, okay. Let me just say. You I'm, don't have your headphones on, but I just dropped a bomb on that statement. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm not going to write music for 20 um, year olds. And that is great because there are going to be 20-year-olds that like what I do, but there's also going to be a whole other population of people that totally are where I'm at. Where Anybody who's writing music for 20-year-olds is failing before they even started. 20-year-olds yeah. decide what they like. Yes. And they yeah. decide what is relevant at that moment That's in right. time. That is right. That and is so right. when I say what is the game and where is the top, you're having the best time of your life. You're yeah. at the top of your game. I feel it, man. I'm so, I'm so inspired right now. I mean, it's... A trip to be raising kids right now. I mean, you know. Oh, yeah. And it's hard to keep your mouth shut. And it's hard for me not to have my heart open because I'm just like taking everything in through their eyes and going, holy crap, man. We need some music. Yeah. We need some, we need some like Paul McCartney yesterday. And yeah, some yeah, you're going through an emotional Neil revolution Finn, right now. Don't dream it's over and some stuff that just rips you apart, you know, yeah. and just yeah. makes you feel. And Yeah. Well, considering the amount of, 
feeling you put into your songs and how much you enabled us to find our feelings through music that were tucked away somewhere. The fact that you've opened up a whole new room where it's even closer and more visceral, that is an emotional revolution. That's what kids do to you, you know? They pull apart yeah. any of those protective layers that yeah. you think are going to keep you in good shape and they're like, they don't come along for the ride. Yeah. They ain't there. No. See and I, I'm so, I mean, obviously I adopted my kids after I had breast cancer and everything shifted. And I was, I'm just more convinced than ever. I tell people all the time when it comes to adopting or having your kids or whatever. Right now, I believe, you know, your kids choose you. They choose their path when they come in. And if you are really aware and are present with them, they are here to also teach you. And man, they're my best teachers. Yeah, they really are. Yeah, they also hold my feet to the fire and they bust me all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they reflect the parts of yeah. you that you love and that you don't upon yourself. And once you get past that, all that stuff, you kind of inherently let it go in terms of you storing it or me, I store it. And then you make room for the good yeah. and the stuff that they bring that's new and fresh. Yeah. And in a way, doing this documentary is a similar thing. You it can was. finally take those files that have been sitting in your hard drive brain and sort of say, all right, they're there, they're never going anywhere, but I don't have to keep clicking them anymore. Like, they're out. Yeah. It's there. And I wonder how you felt looking back on it, having done it, whether you felt a little more space inside of you to move forward and not be that Cheryl. Yeah, I mean, there was something really, um, I mean, I hate to say the word cathartic, but there was something cathartic about it. I mean, I had... I had the safety net of having people around me that I trusted. Obviously, my manager is has always been with me, but also is a large part of the documentary. He was also a producer on it. Handsome devil. Very handsome. So, In fact, gosh. there's a chemistry between the two of you. Oh, well, we're both aging gracefully. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, and you game both, recognized you, game, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yes, yeah. And you're both <laughs> really sharp dressers as well. Um, anyway... <laughs> Um, but just, you know, trusting Amy and her artistic choices and, but also her knowing that, look, I'm not here to talk about awards. There's a world of living that started at a really young age, being born with melancholy. Um, and that being the driving force of my finding my identity in music. And then later on in life, that raising its ear its ugly head and also informing me about how to deal with the low lows and the high highs. I mean, it's still difficult for me to talk about it without getting emotional because it's, you know, it's such a, it's a part of who I am and, and I've never had the liberty to really talk about it. And, and people don't talk about it. You know, they don't talk about struggling with mental illness, depression, and it's a very real part of who I am, but also why I am. And, that is the part that you can't project on social media. And even if you could, um, you you have to be able to suffer the ugly things that come in too, you know. So it's it's nice to be able to tell my story and have it be out and then I'm I'm done. You know, I watched it once and I felt like it it told the story. The story that Amy and her crew decided this is the story that needs to be told. There are a lot of other things that could have been told as well, but there's not time. And I think they did a great job and they covered the things that I think were most important about my journey. You, you know, you watched it once. I've watched it twice so far. I watched music documentaries many times. Oh my gosh. Did you watch the Beatles? <laughs> Chance? I know. Of course. I, mean, I made my si myself sick with it. The last, the last one I watched twice back to back. And then I felt like, I wanted to have a wake or something. I, I was so... Well, because it was the end of it, a, a real era for all of humanity yes. who grew up in that time. Because yes. those mysteries and those questions and without answers were sort of what kept us connected in a lot of ways. And so to finally get the last chapter of the series yeah. of the books yeah. was like, well, what do you mean there's no more books? Yeah. And then also to be able to go down the rabbit hole after seeing it and after witnessing the brilliance in the room and real inspiration and creativity and also a friendship between all four of them 
And then being able to go down the rabbit hole and read the interview with Paul McCartney and him talking about, look, the press painted us out to be enemies, but John and I talked, you know, many times throughout life. And it just we, ran its course. You know, all of it just, I don't know. I felt like after I watched it, I really missed them. I don't know how people will feel after seeing this documentary. I think it will definitely res- resonate with some women. I think it will resonate with women outside of our business, uh, particularly women inside of our business. Mm-hmm. Hopefully it will resonate with people who have had struggles like I've had with depression and and manic, the high highs and the low lows. Um, and also hopefully it will help us to sort of as women embrace being our ages and honoring that and feeling proud of it, you know, and not feeling like I got to run, get my face fixed to look younger so that I'm more palatable to look at or I'm more perfect or whatever, that this is part of, I think it's part of the beautiful part of the journey. I agree. You know? I agree. And I think that you talk about what, how younger generations deal with those expectations now versus what you went through. And I've come to the conclusion that I don't think there's any era, whether it's today's generation or your generation, the generation before, had it any worse or any better. It just is what it is in the time. Yeah. Because on the one hand, you've got kids these days who are far more open about their internal struggle, so that's great. But on the other hand, there's far more opportunity for them to be faced with insecurity, anxiety, sense of self-worth, mm-hmm. judgment, all that stuff. Right. Now, the flip side of that is is that, you know, you had to go through all that as as well, but you didn't have the ability to tell people, this is hard. This is tough. You were in a generation where it was like, lights, camera, smile. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Because your business depends on it. And by the way, if your business depends on it, then your survival depends on it. Because as an artist, you literally connect the idea of being able to sell records with, I will die if I don't. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then also generationally, you know, your race is sort of like, well, you need to quit thinking about it. Make yourself busy. Find something to do. Uh, volunteer if you're if you're down. I mean, and also what do you have to be down about? You're famous. You're you famous. Tons of money, you've got you've you're, all you your know. dreams have come true. Yeah. So go distract yourself with work because it works really good in terms of keeping the black dog at bay. Exactly. Yeah. And I, you know, I do. I, I, I think we've we've come so far, um, but we still are. In other areas, we're still in that dark closet, you know. Um, I I was having a conversation. In fact, we have a new song on the um, soundtrack called Forever. And it was born of talking to my 15-year-old who is, you know, he's he he is a deep feeler. He's an empath. Um, He's always been that way. And I'd love to take credit for it, but I think he was born that way. Um, they come out how they come out. I think they come out how they come out, yes. Yeah, we guide it, but it ain't really. Yeah, we yeah. just try not to Get mess away. it up. Yeah. 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 And talking about, you know, the amount of stress and the anxiety. And, you know, I didn't have this kind of stress when I was a kid. Like being a teenager was hard because of hormones and things. But I wasn't worried about somebody I love dying in a pandemic or some wacky leader dropping a, you know, a, a, a bomb on our country. The stress they go through compounded with, the amount of um, expectation put on them to be perfect, to look perfect, constant feedback. It's a different world. And the suicide rate going up in teenagers is just, you know, shocking. And so I wound up writing this song called Forever about the idea that we have to stay in every moment because we can't really, we can't change the ones behind us and we can't dictate the ones in front of us. Well, that's the definition of anxiety, isn't it? It is. And I have to like remind myself of that, Mm -hmm. you know. Oh, yeah, as a parent, because guess what? The biggest fears of all time are what happened before, what hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. Did I make the wrong decision as a kid with a really important time five years ago and put them in the wrong school or the wrong thing? Or what is that going to lead to down the road and all the unknowns? And it's, God, the moment, that's a real practice. I mean, I feel like songwriting is is a huge tool for staying in the present moment. And mm-hmm. in the end, we get to absorb it into our life as fans and it changes the context of our lives and what we think and feel. But what you get out of it is you get to break that spell for that singular moment of being able to just write. Because you can't give anything of yourself to anything else, right? For it to be effective. It's interesting though. I can remember after being diagnosed with breast cancer and then 
also having gone through a very public breakup, I moved from LA because I had like paparazzi shooting into my living room and trying to capture me at my lowest. And I came out of it making a pact with myself. I'm not going to go and write. I'm not going to, you know, try to write an incredible song. I'm not going to take this experience and try to produce something. And music is, it's a salve, but there was a point at which for me, it was bigger than a salve. It was like a life buoy. And I had to figure out some way to tread without that being the thing that was giving me self-worth. Wow. You know, and that's a hard thing when you put yourself, you connect yourself so deeply with your work that mm-hmm. you have to sort of go, okay, if I'm not my work, then who am I? Oh, I got to drop another yeah. one on that. Wow. That is, that's <laughs> a first, you know, because I, like I'm just in this for the curiosity, right? I'm obsessed with the art and I'm obsessed with the, with the way that where it comes from, right? That's going to be my life. I've realized now that's my life. Outside of raising my family and being a good family member and a friend and a husband and a father. I'm just on that journey, right? I, I mean, I Which just, is why you're really good at it. I mean, you follow, you follow the conversation. You don't have like a set of things that you need to cover or whatever, and that's a beautiful thing. And that is a that is staying in the moment as well. That's listening, connecting. And there was a great uh, quote from the Dalai Lama saying, "The most genuine way you can show." anyone love is by being present. And I have to remind myself that. I mean, when I'm looking at my phone, you know, while we're watching the Bucks play, I'm like, dude, how many screens? What do you, what do you need here? How do you expect you them know? to win another championship if you're not going to uh, exactly. give your full attention? Exactly. Had to throw that in there. Go Bucks, right? <laughs> exactly. By Go the Bucks. way, I'm a, I'm a fair weather supporter. I only support the, the, the teams that, that my guests support. So right now I'm like, Go Bucks. Okay, yes. Perfect. That's all I care about. Tomorrow might be something different. Just FYI. Don't judge all me right, on that. Well, it's going to be Bucks <laughs> all the way for us. Although I got to say, I want to see Chris Paul. I know. Dude, I mean... We all want him to win one. I want him to win we one. We all want him to see it to get a ring. It's yeah, important. I mean, I do. Well, yeah, he's given want, to the game. I want the Bucks um, and... Mm. Yeah, Phoenix Suns. Phoenix Suns. Yeah. I want them to... Yeah. And then I want Chris Paul to go home with the ring. I'm wow, sorry, Wow, so you're actually willing to give up a I'm Bucks... I'm sorry, Chris and, you know, Middleton. Uh, I'm sorry, Drew Holiday. Yeah, that's your team. That's But that's beautiful. That's empathetic. Like, at the end of the day, you know, when you've been... So it's just such an integral part of, of of not only promoting the what's good about the game, but also being a strong advocate for family... And also for for the Players Association, I mean, he's gone above and beyond his own success and gift and wealth to promote this game in the right way. So I'd love him to get a ring too. I think a lot of people would. I think so too. But I just, man, he needs to relax though. He gets so, it's just like, oh man, let go a little bit. I want to just go give him a big hug. You said something before, which made me exclaim on that, which was that you don't want your work to become such a, like the gift of what you do that normally brings you joy to be a crutch, to be another part of the distraction medication. Yeah. That's huge. So what did you do instead? Well, it was funny. Um, You know, I, I, I didn't write a single thing until I felt like I wanted to open my mouth. And there was a long period there where I didn't want to open my mouth. I just wanted to listen. Um, and I had been a meditator before that, but I really got into meditating. I had to learn. Um, I was working with this guy in New York City who one of the things that he said that really struck me was that, um, you know, the the gateway to awakening is learning to hold an emotion. And there were emotions that I was holding or that I was not holding that were somewhere in my body that go all the way back. And we all have it. We all have a story we've told ourselves since we were little about who we are. Helps you to cope. And I had to like figure out a way to work work my way through all of it and come out the other side. And in the process of all that, um, I adopted Wyatt and I wrote a song three months after he was born from a New York Times um, story about the real estate market. And the title was God Bless This Mess. It was 6.30 in the morning and I just fed Wyatt and I opened up the paper and I see this God Bless This Mess and I started writing. And then I wrote the Detours record and it felt like, oh, this is this is enjoyable and it, I don't have to do this. Well, also, I don't have to do it. It's such an important realization, especially when you're swept up in this kind of undertow. Yeah of business and crowds. And there's a moment in this documentary, I always look for those moments that like make me reel a little bit or laugh or mm-hmm. laugh ironically. Yeah. Just, 
unprovoked little nods of like, even if I'm on my, if I'm on my own. And, the, and one of the ones that did, and there's a few in this doc, one of the ones that really made me chuckle to myself was like, a, do you ever think you'll stop touring? And you go, not until I'm dead. And everyone goes, yeah! <laughs> and I just fucking cracked up, man. I was like, and there's the problem, right? Exactly. We never see the signs. I mean, it, you're basically crying for help and it's TRL's like, you're the best, Cheryl. Yes, exactly. Keep going. And, Keep and, going till you die. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And oh, and that is exactly, <laughs> that is that rabbit hole, man. Uh, you know, I, 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 at which point I was diagnosed, I had... I'd gone through a relationship with Lance. Uh, before that, I had turned 40 when everybody on the radio was like 17. And um, and I kept saying, okay, as soon as I get off the road, I'm going to make a record. That way I can take some time off. Couldn't finish the record. Couldn't take time off. I mean, it just gets to be this thing where I, I got to make a record. I got it so that I can tour. But I first, I want to take some time off, but I can't do that until I make a record. That's it's why I call like, it the undertow, because you don't know where it's up and where it's down. Yeah. Yeah. You just, it's thrashy as shit. But usually life will hand you your ass in a paper cup. And that is exactly like the day I got diagnosed, I was like, oh, okay. All right. You don't have to hit me over the head. I get it. Mm -hmm. And so how, how hard was it to hold on to it? Because one thing to get it, yeah. It's another thing to continue with that learning and not become, because you had 40 years becoming the Cheryl you were before that. Yeah, I didn't, I mean, at the at the end of the day, I didn't really love it or enjoy it the way I, I thought I would, you know what I mean? And making the documentary was funny because I, I have these vivid memories of laying under our piano. You know, we grew up with a great big stereo in the living room and had all the albums and I had all, uh, all all the magazines and I would pour over the album notes and I just had this vision about what it was going to look like and what it was going to feel like, you know, and it's all dreamy. It's all like Stevie Nicks, you know, I just, you know, every time I would think of myself, I had a, a wind machine on, <laughs> you know, I was like <laughs> flowy and it's going to be beautiful and I'm going to love it. And, and there were some incredible moments, but after a while it's, it felt like work, you know, it felt like, what am I doing? And where am I in this thing? Once the transition happened, it's not ever felt the same again. It's felt so much more intact and so much, I'm so much less attached to it and I enjoy it so much more. Which is all we can ask for. Um, because it's a human experience at the end of the day, right? Yeah. It's, it's great that we have these songs and wow. What a what a collection of songs. Like, in case you didn't know, or maybe you did, you still needed reminding that there, it's just hit after hit after hit after hit. And my question is, like, before we even go back to the first run of hits, which has to be acknowledged to some degree, when you were getting into album number four, when you're getting into Come On, Come On, and it's like, you're still on that 100-foot wave. Like, does it ever get to a point where you're thinking... You know, I would, I'm grateful for this song and I'm grateful for the fact that everybody loves it. But am I ever going to just not be this? Like the pressure so, and the hits and the... That record was the the giant nightmare. It, I, I came off the road after the third record and um, that was the record. I said, I'm just going to make a record pretty quick and then I take some time off. Um, I moved to New York City. Um, I'd been engaged. I moved to New York City um, made the Globe Sessions, toured that. It was great. And then came home from that and bought a house in L.A., moved my studio into the living room, like set it up in the living room. And then I got to where I just didn't even want to go home because it was like this throbbing organism, you know, saying, you got to go to work, you know. And, a, you know, months went by and I couldn't finish anything. And um, by the time I finished that record, I'd spent a million and a half I had gone through like every idea, couldn't finish anything. And then Britney Spears comes on the scene and Christina Aguilera. I'm turning 40. I haven't had kids yet. And I'm just like, holy crap, what What am I doing? Um, and I, I think I talked about in the documentary how I ran into Chrissy Hunt. And she's like, you, got, you know, this isn't your life. This is your work. Take time off. And so I did. And I threw myself a giant 
40th birthday party, <laughs> which, of course, nobody back then had cell phones. And Amy so and her crew real, were like... It was a real ruckus. Well, we used to have parties at my house. I mean, my house was the party house. Like, we had a party for the Rolling Stones and, uh, you know... And this was in the day and age where it was like Warren Beatty and Marianne Faithful and Minnie Driver and Gwyneth and Robert Downey Jr. and um, Sean Penn and um, Jack Nicholson and Rick Rubin and Heidi Fleiss. I mean, just like a crazy menagerie. Yeah, this is good celebrity. Really, you know, it's like uh, yeah. you don't know who's going to turn out. John Travolta and um, Amy's like, we, we, do you have any pictures? I'm like, no, hell no. Nobody had cell phones back then. So I'm turning 40. I throw this giant party at the El Rey and invite all these people to come up and sit in. You know, Bonnie Raitt sat in. Ben Harper sat in. Um, I think Jim Carrey sat in. I mean, it's just like a free for all. And then we went over to Dominic's and that went on. And 40 was the most fantastic year. And Soak Up the Sun came out. And the first cut is the deepest came out. And it was like, oh. I can do this. I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like it never happened. Yeah. You know, it was like... It's like opening the door after a, after a nightmare renovation. They tell you that you open the door and you're like, ah, oh, do it all again. Exactly. It's like, what about the it's last like four I've, years, I've, bottomless pit of I've disaster? I've just had a monster baby. Yeah, 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 no, I might do it again, yeah, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. But after that, it, 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 I feel like that's when you started to make the decision. Like, mm. or whether you made it or it was made for you, mm. I need to recalibrate this. Because before that, I can't even put the years in order, but there was a lot of years of a lot of work, a lot of hits, a mm -hmm. lot of you. You became a one word. You stopped being Cheryl Crow. You became Cheryl. When you become a one word, your name sort of stops being yours in a way. Like, yeah. what is your relationship like yeah. with your name when people scream it at you from the street all the time? And it's just like, I didn't yeah. sort of, you know what I mean? Like, is it it's mine anymore? It's a weird anymore? thing. I mean, it's, it's um, for somebody like me who, you know, I'm from a really small town, I wanted to be great. I didn't want to, famous wasn't like the end all goal. I just wanted to be great. And I don't know what that was supposed to look like, but when you become famous, it's a, it does a number on you. You know, it's like, it's so much fun to be invited to the party, but all you can think about is what if I don't get invited to the next one, you know, or, um, you know, what happens when I stop getting invited to the party? And, um, it does a number, you know, it definitely That's does a That's a self-worth issue, right? It ultimately replaces it your sense of self-worth yes. with the worth that other people apply to your identity. Exactly, yeah. Which is one of the reasons I'm just like, if I had to like deal with daily social media and seeing what people had to say, I, I've i not read a review or an article since my second record because I got my feelings hurt so badly. And I just went, this isn't normal. You know, it's not normal to read people's opinions when you've done your best. I mean, I can't go back and change anything. I did the best I could. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to read anything else. Um, but it definitely does a number. And for me, um, I did start to lose it. And I did wind up feeling like I wasn't sure who I was anymore. I couldn't figure out how to get out from under all of it, the weight of it. Yeah, because every night, this is the other thing. There's a moment when you're singing Soak Up the Sun and it's the perspective of the crowd, the camera and the audio track is in the crowd. So you can barely hear you or you can hear is us screaming this song back at you. And what struck me about it is this timeless image of fans giving everything to the artist for the as a trade for the song in the first place. It felt heavy to me. It was weird. It was like, if you're not in the mood and my whole night, hard-earned money is relying on this being an existential experience. Yeah. That's a huge burden. I'm really deep in this conversation because I'm trying to reset the balance one conversation at a time about what the expectation is between us and you. So there's a there's a pre-existing thing too that goes along with that. Like for me, it isn't even just about, I mean, I want my fans to be happy. I'm like a people pleaser, right? So my the story I told myself from the earliest of ages, if I did everything right, that I would be loved. That's what you do. You make good grades. You are, you know, you try not to get in trouble and then your parents love you. And I think there a lot, this is like psych 101. I think a lot of people who wind up being famous, who put themselves out there, um, are, are seeking love and adoration and acceptance and approval. Um, so it's, it's heavy when you are standing on stage and you don't feel like being there. And yet, I'm taking care. I'm not just taking care of the band. I'm actually, or my image, I'm taking care of all the people that are out there who want to 
be, you know, they want to enjoy themselves. Yeah, the I'm caretaking. To, you're you don't the even ticket know. to ride. Yes. And it, it, after a while, I mean, just even energetically. And when I was going through breast cancer treatment, this buddy of mine that I was talking about, he said, just notice energetically how exhausting it is to have people projecting their energy at you. Even, you know, even wishing you well, there'll be people you've never met in your life that are going to be praying for you. There are going to be people you've never met in your whole life that don't like you for some reason. They've decided that you're this or you're that and you're getting what you deserve. But all of that is energy. You know, you stand in front of 50,000 people or even 300 people and you're playing. It's all energy. Oh, let me tell you, mortality drives people crazy. Yeah. That's why we go crazy yes. when our parents die and all that stuff. It's, and a cra- it's fear. It's, it's you fear, know, right? a lot of fear. You're faced with it yourself. Yeah. A friend of mine said to me once, I might have said this to you last time, I can't remember, but it's a good reminder if I did, when I was going to make one of those calls to someone who's going through something. And he said, oh, I don't know if it's the time. He said, you know, sometimes you just got to remember you got to be thoughtful with your thoughtfulness. Mm. And people will just forget that. That's a good thing to remember. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it, it's, you know, no matter what you're going through, um, you know, we all experience the same emotions. They just are wrapped up in different experiences from fear to sadness and grief and all that stuff. And death is definitely, that's a heavy number. And when you get diagnosed with something, then everybody around them starts reassessing and it's all kind of revolving around your experience. And I think one of the things that for me as I've gotten older, I'm making more sense out of life and life is hard to make sense of. And part of... How's that going then? (laughs) I know, it's hard. But there's so, there is so much to this idea of energy. You know, whether people think it's woo-woo or not, we're all so connected. I mean, I'm sure everybody that is in this room and that's listening can understand how in the quiet moments how you can feel terrible for the people that are going through what they're going through in Ukraine, even though that's not our experience. But we can understand it. We have the ability to be empathetic. Um, But it also plays into what's happening here. I mean, we're watching things change in this country that are very frightening. It is maddening. It is. It is maddening. To feel like we can be the same species on this earth at the same time. Yeah. In a country like this with give or take a layer, like like a sliding scale, a ladder, the same democratic capitalist principles of, of opportunity and be so opposed. Like, I don't even know you. Like, how can we share the same planet? And I just cannot understand your thinking to the point where I'm like, feel like we're on two different planets. It started to blow my mind so much when I felt the tension in my family, and we're a close-knit family, but just politically, the chasm that it's driven into all of our, well, to most of our families, not being able to sit around a table and be able to discuss topics. Uh, I mean, there's certain things now that are just off limits. Just to preserve the peace. Yes, just to preserve the peace and to still have a relationship. And That is, is real unconditional love when you're willing to shelve something that needs to be talked about because you know that if you don't, it could be curtains. Yeah, and we've had some of those curtains conversations and we do love each other enough, but you know, some, I do feel like there's a little bit of residue of damage, you know, and um, I wound up revisiting The New Earth by Eckhart Tolle, which is a great book. I tried to read it years ago um, and I did read most of it, but it didn't mean as much to me, so I started listening to it. And it blew my mind. It made seem, it made everything seem extremely simple to understand. That doesn't mean it's changeable right now. But, um, you know, where we're at in, in this moment in our evolution or our humanity or, or our non-evolution, I, I think it is, it's all a soul thing. It's all, we, energetically, we're all so connected and, um, how you feel is going to, it's going to overlap over onto me and mm-hmm. how I feel mm-hmm. is going to do the same for you. It's all chemistry. It's it all, is. It's all just a big swirl. And when it all makes sense, and normally, sad to admit, it's during times of real tragedy that brings the world together where we ignore our differences for a brief moment. There's some kind of 
brilliant hue that occurs at that time where it all just the color is just warm and beautiful even if it's sad uh, the rest of it it's hard to make you know any kind of sense of it at all and uh i hope that this is the thrash that leads to a better place i hope that this is one of those moments because bringing it back to the documentary what it really brought home for me was how much strength you've had to show even at times when you haven't been strong mm. in order to do right. You talk about people pleasing like at the highest level to do right by the people that are looking to you to lead because of the position you're in, what the songs mean, who you are, the, the, the year you were born in, the time you're successful. And to be at a point now where you've, you've, resh you've reshifted your priorities into something that gives you different kind of joy and still to take a step back with some altitude and see that the world is still burning in some of these places, I, makes me sad. I can't imagine how it makes you feel. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, that conversation about energy and all that stuff, I, and I mentioned how getting older, it, you have sort of an, an Edgar Mitchell view, you know, that, that view as an astronaut looking back on planet Earth, and you can't fix everything. And for me, it, it, for a very long time, that was very personal to me. Um, that we weren't, that we don't do more for each other and that we don't show each other more compassion or empathy or whatever. Um, and that the world feels and seems harsher, even just social media and, um, and the way we agree or disagree or just all of it. And viewing that through the lens of being a mom to two young boys, even, I mean, even raising boys in this moment where music is something that I police which is such a weird thing. I mean, I police what my kids listen to. Isn't that sick? And I'm a musician. I mean, I'm just like, what am I doing? But, you know, you tell I, you, you tell, you I, know. I signed up to be the protector of their innocence and I don't want to have to explain what WAP, you know, I'm just saying like... Your boys must have an auntie or an well, uncle who plays that role. my older one is 15 now. Um, uh, and I'm sure he's seen a lot more that I know about. I'm, in fact, I'm very positive. Um, but he's gotten over the fact that he doesn't have social media. Um, I mean, he sees plenty of stuff that he wants to see. I'm sure he goes around, you know, but I do, you know, I look at their phones and stuff. But this is a, it's a microcosm, you know, and I hope that people, if they watch the doc documentary, will see that everything feels so monumentally challenging when you're going through it. But at a certain point, you are like an astronaut, kind of having an overview and looking at it and going, it's all going to be okay. You know, it's all going to be okay. It's like your friend Joe Walsh said, right? When he when he paraphrased the great story and the line, the, 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 the philosopher that said, you know, the, 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 great, the great narrative of life, right? That when you're in the middle of it, it just, you don't know whether what's up or what's down or what's left or what's right. But at the end of it, it's a perfect script. Script yes. of a perfect film. Yeah. You know, beginning and an end. Yeah. These life stories that we live in. And that, to me, that's the promise. And that's also the glory and the, you know, you live through it and man, you feel deeper and you see clearer and you experience joy. Um, everything isn't so black and white, you know, and you can enjoy, you know, the being in the gray and not knowing everything, but just, you know. When, um, when you were talking about the enormous success of Tuesday Night Music Club, and then, of course, this, you, I mean, you were one of the first people to effectively be canceled. In oh, a, yeah. In a, in a way. Yeah. You w found yourself in a situation, which happens in everyday life to everybody, but a lot of cameras, a lot of people, and then a lot of attention, a lot of success, a lot of this. It's just heady, like, wow, okay, and that's kind of, boom. And there's a moment when you're when you're sort of going through that time and you get visibly emotional during the recounting of that story what were you ultimately grieving at that moment in time were you still sad for the situation were you thinking about the younger self and what you were going through and how you just wish you could have been there for yourself as well was it a lot of that because it was a long time ago but clearly it still resonates. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about the John O'Brien suicide. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's really the first time I've ever told my side, 
you know, I've been very, I've been very quiet about it. I've not ever stood up and defended um, myself against the claims that were made. And it was the out first- Out of respect. Out of respect. Yes. You know, I, um, I am, I mean, I'm a really sensitive person and I, I value family. And like I said, in the documentary, John was somebody's son. I know that it was not my fault, but I think it was the betrayal and also the disappointment and wow, this incredible union that I had with these people that were friends. Um, you know, I, I wasn't perfect. I got really kind of, uh, I was a deer in headlights on, on the Letterman show and just to watch it all swirl into this really dark place to actually talk about it for the first time was overwhelming. And it brought up all kinds of old, you know, you know, to revisit it and to actually experience it, to put myself back in my body and actually feel that, um, I mean, the grief over it, the grief and the anger, you know, uh, sadness, the, all that stuff that goes along with it. Um, I didn't know when we did the hours and hours and hours and days of hours um, of interviewing what would actually make the documentary. Um, but I also didn't want it to be a documentary of all feel good. I mean, I've had an incredible 35 years of, or 40 years of touring, of playing music, of backing up people, of doing my own stuff. And there have been some incredible moments, but the moments that were more defining for me were the ones where I had to like face myself and regroup and redefine and refine. And that was definitely one of them. And it was early on and it, it, it changed the way I saw myself in the universe of what I was doing. Um, and it changed how I felt about the business and being... How could it not? How could it not being the young female rising superstar that's been collaborating with a group of men mm -hmm. and then to be caught off guard and have a personality trait that requires you to like crouch at the bar out of respect and just let this settle, which by the way, I can relate to that. How does it not darken the horizon somewhat? It definitely changed me. And when I, it's funny because when I look at the artwork, like Tuesday Music Club, it's like girl in a jean shirt, yeah, no makeup. Yeah. Then you go to like- Not a worry in the world. Yeah. Then you go to Sheryl Crow and I look like yeah. goth, you yeah. know? And I was yeah. like, uh-uh, I'm not going to let the world in. I'm not going to be girl next door. I'm not going to listen to people saying I did write my own record, that <sighs> a bunch of, of men innocence, wrote it. And that's just- Yeah. It was the end of the innocence for me. It really was. Yeah. Well, you know, in a way, as sad as that is, it has to happen in everyone's life at some point. It you, does. You can no longer play the children's game, as the movie says, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, there, there, there comes that maturity and that ability to control your narrative. Um, but, you know, the thing is, if you're a person that wants everybody to be happy with you and you want everyone to love you because you always do the right thing, mm -hmm. um, when it doesn't go down that way, then you feel like you've been sat in timeout and you're in trouble and you're the bad kid. And that, you know, it just plays into all those. I mean, life is literally one long therapy session. <laughs> you know, it's what you do with it that matters the most. It's truth. It's truth. It's, and it's also most of what we learn is on a playground, which means we're not emotionally mature as a species yeah. to truly be able to deal with other people's trauma, right? Yeah, because true. we either run for the hills and play with another group of kids or we kick them even harder. Yeah, it's true. You know, it's all it's all there when in those in those really formative years that they force us onto a concrete schoolyard for eight hours with no real guidance. I know it's literally like a zoo. <laughs> it's a zoo, yes. and it's survival of the fittest. And yes. then we walk into the real world, and we're like, I know everything I need to know. That's right. And you're That's like, right. Nah, man. Yeah. It's a show. Yeah. This is a story about friendship as well, and aside from his sartorial elegance and dashing elder handsomeness. Your manager and you, is a, it's a beautiful lesson and choose your people carefully. Mm -hmm. Because the moments when he supports you and you support each other when you really need it, I have been doing this a long time. And I have heard stories from artists way after the fact that I should have been better taken care of, mm. wrapped up when I needed to be, taken off the road. And by the way, 
Those are the those are the good those are the good times. I get to hear those stories. There are people who don't even make it. Yeah, and I I'm philosophical about these things. I mean, that's another part of getting older. I'm I, I'm very philosophical about the people in my life because um, the people that were there in the beginning are still here, and I think um, there was that goofy book. It basically threw out the idea that you come into to life and you you share every life with the same people, right? right, right in different right, right. In, in different in, incarnations or whatever. W- however, it worked out. You know, Scooter and I are kindred spirits. We're like family members. We're like an old married couple. You know, um, Pam, who works with Scooter, has been there from the very beginning. I mean, my tour manager has been there. Tw- I mean, everybody's been there long enough that I'll have to have them killed. <laughs> If they leave, because they know where all the dead bodies are. But, um, you know, it's it has been, um, I mean, it's been a source of strength and a source of support. And we've been that for each other, all of us. We've all gone through really hard personal trials, and we've all been there for each other. And that, to me, is, that's more important to me than any Grammy or any um, any award, any high-profile anything having people around you that know you and that are honest with you and tell you that your shit does stink. Um, I mean, mine doesn't stink very often. I'm just saying, but <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. That's four bums in a conversation. That's, um, <laughs> it's getting up, upwards towards the record. Uh, but he is, he is the star of this show. Definitely. But isn't it just relationships at the end of the day? It is. Isn't it, it really what it's all is. about? It is. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just all about. Don't you get more of a kick out of hanging out with Keith Ridges and you do it making an acceptance speech at an award show? I mean, isn't oh that, my gosh! What, isn't that the I mean, dream? honestly, it's just yeah. I that's mean, that's the club you want to be in. right? That's the club you want to be in, and you, you know, you have to also like give it up for those moments. Like you got to like go. Did that just happen? And look at my life, and I got like people that I love that I've known since I was you know young. Uh, it, it's it's tremendous, you know. At what point do you think it could have taken a different turn? Thinking back on it now, now that we're doing this rare reflection and next time we speak will be about hopefully a new record. But what was the moment that you feel this story, this documentary would have would have come out very differently if been made at all? Yeah, well, I mean, there's so many of those along the way. I mean, I could have married the first guy I was engaged to and stayed a school teacher and had kids. Um, I could have come home from the Michael Jackson tour after that year of going through some real... Uh, trial and tribulation. Trial and, by fire, huh? Yeah, and just gone home. Um, especially after hearing so many people say, we can't sign you, you're not Madonna. Oh, back in, you know? I mean, that's what, that's what you know, 20 Feet from Stardom's about. Like, yeah. you think it's going to be the fast pass and your talent's going to be on display every night, but we actually just like you there. We you're like you great there. great support. Unless you want to do what everybody else is doing right now at radio, then we'll take what you've done and use that as a springing board if you'll just do what Paul Abdul's doing. And that just wasn't my jam. So, so that was, that would have been a game changer. I mean, there was a moment where my mom flew out and said, you have to get out of bed. You know, you're six months and you've not left the apartment and it's time for you to get back to the living. Mm -hmm. And did it feel like six months? It felt like six years. Did it feel like six minutes? Looking back on it. Um, it felt like a really long time. I mean, there was a moment where, you know, I'm too I'm too thoughtful to ever think about committing suicide. I mean, I didn't want anybody to be hurt, but I also didn't want to wake up. Mm-hmm. Um, That's real hopelessness, huh? It was real hopelessness. But, you know, I got to say, you're talking about relationships, having a family, having people. I mean, if your family is one person, then you have a family, you know, and um, just having mom show up up at my door and say, I know you don't want me here, but you're going to get up and you're going to put one foot in front of the other and you're going to get yourself help. And that, you know, um, that could have been a moment. I've had a lot of moments along the way. I don't know. I'm going to start crying. I don't know why everything has gone the way it's gone. I'm just lucky. Well, yeah, we all are. We all are. We just got to acknowledge it. But, um, just to be here. But also, I don't know. I think you're super fearless. Oh, thank you. I really do. I, th- I don't think you can write these songs and push through some of these challenges you've been through and, and find this kind of be focused on energy and be focused on chemistry 
and be searching for something that's kind of deeper than what you've already seen because you've seen it all. You've seen a lot of sides of life and a lot of sh- and you've seen some real highs, but also you know what it is to your point to be the lowest of the low, right? So what is it? So I guess I'm looking at you and I'm like, all right, what does Cheryl Crow think it's all about? And it sounds to me like you think it's all about going beyond all of that, that that's not the metric of value, that none of that is what it's all about. It's actually something that we're still searching for. Is that fair to say? I think that's very fair to say. You know, I, I think about my little, both my boys I had within hours of their birth and I, I can remember, especially with Wyatt going, man, he already knows everything. I just got to figure out some some way not to unknow it for him. I don't want to imprint on him because I don't know everything yet. And isn't that what it is? We're just searching to really know who we we authentically are and how to find joy and acceptance in that. I can't wait for this next record, you know, because I mean, who tells their first life story and still has such a long road to run and so much to do? And so much to write about, should you want to. That's like, wow. It's perfect timing. Your team were right. It's the perfect timing to kind of put that to one side. Well, I have to say, I've never felt more inspired to write. Um, you know, this song forever. Mm. Whether people like it or not, it's my favorite song we've ever written, Jeff and I. And I feel like every time I walk in the studio, I have that that excitement about walking out later and having something that has never been written before. And that to me is, I mean, that's the God thing. That's the, you know, how do we define inspiration or, I don't know. That's what magic is. That's what magic is, man. It is.